Fantastic. So let's get going. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and for being here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the OVI, the Open Vector Interface. And without further ado, what is it and why would you ever need it? Um, it's an open source specification which you can download from uh, GitHub that we've produced that allows you to connect the RISC-5 vector unit following the RISC-5 spec to a RISC-5 core. And why would you want to do that? The, the vector unit is, uh, the vector spec is already big enough. Why would you have to read a second document, right? Well, um, this is useful if you are interested in building your own vector unit and you, maybe you have lots of uh, special instructions you want to create and you're not interested or you don't have a particular time or people to um, create the core that would drive that vector unit. In that case, you could get a core from us or from someone else because the spec is open. Um, and the core would actually do for you the vector memory accesses and hold the control CSRs, while your VPU could do the rest of the computation, vector adds, vector multiplies, and your super secret instructions or super interesting instructions, right? Uh, by the way, and uh, uh, jumping ahead, um, even though there's a division of responsibilities, the vector unit still sees all the instructions, all the vector instructions in the instruction flow. So you can optimize things, or even if you need to know how many loads have been done, or you want to count something, you will have that information. Um, the interface is relatively simple. It's all credited thinking about the idea that maybe two different teams, one is building the core, the other one is building the vector unit. So maybe there's timing constraints uh, or the vector unit is very large and the core is very small and they're sort of gonna be far away and the wires are slow as we all know. So it's a credited interface and basically handles the synchronization or the uh, you know agreements between the core and the VPU. Um, the protocol itself, to the best of our uh, intentions, does not constrain the VPU implementation. So, you know, you could make the VPU in order, you can make it out of order, or however advanced you feel it's necessary. And uh, we have actually used this um, protocol to connect the um, our one of our cores, the Avispato 220, uh, with a VPU from one of our partners, be a Barcelona Supercomputing Center and University of Zagreb. And basically we've be, be used this protocol and we've actually taped out a test chip that contains this protocol. So we know it's um, you know pretty alive and uh, we're happy if other people use it or other people use it to connect to our cores or um, you know, you'll be the, the judges whether this is interesting to you or not. And uh, having said all of that, um, one more thing before I hand it over to Alberto. Um, just to put this in context, uh, this is showing the high-level view of the uh, our RISC-5 core, Avispato 220. There's a standard iCache, uh, FEDS decode issue, integer floating point, and there's a load store unit. The load store unit, as we anticipated, does the vector loads and the vector stores, and also handles masking, vector load mask, and also handles gathers and scatters, so indexed um, index vector memory accesses, right? And um, then there's a, this box called the core side interface that speaks this OVI uh, specification that Alberto will describe in a second. And then on the in green, the VPU is what you, the hopefully there's a listener here interested in this, uh, you would be building that VPU and you would be speaking OVI with that core side interface. The vector control registers are on the blue side, so on the core side, because the load store unit also needs to know a lot of stuff about the current vector state. Um, um, state. But other than that, uh, this uh, greatly simplifies the amount of work that you have to do to get the vector spec done. So you can focus on the arithmetic, on the computation, and leave the uh, load stores, uh, exception handling, branch handling to the core. So having said that, I'm going to stop sharing and let uh, Alberto share. Hopefully this is going to go seamless. Thank you. And Alberto, all yours. Hey, Roger. Uh, so I hope you can see my screen. Yes, keep going. Good. I'm going to go on mute. Thanks. So uh, I will be describing the more technical aspects of the OVI. Uh, first, I want to... Uh, make a special emphasis that the main feature of the OVI is that is highly decoupled from the core. Uh, in fact, 
the core will only decode uh, configuration and memory instructions. So configuration instructions are those that only affect the status registers and memory are those that need to be executed on the, on the core. Uh, this allows the VPU to have some, let's call them secret instructions. So instructions that the core knows nothing about. Also the VPU, as, as Rudy mentioned, might be implemented in order or out of order, depending on uh, the implementer, how complicated it needs it. The, the OVI does not set a restriction on this. So uh, before we start describing the, the OVI, let me divide the structures into three categories. First, we have the uh, configuration instructions, which are those that affect the status registers. Those are executed on, on the core. Uh, the core will send the information about the status registers to the, through the OVI uh, when an operation needs it. Then we have the arithmetic operations. Those are executed exclusively on the VPU, and these are most of the operations. Uh, so if you have a, any operation uh, that the core does not need to know about, it will fall into this category. Last, we have the memory operations. Those are vector loads and vector stores that need to be executed in tandem between the, the VPU and the core. So here um, we have this, this graphic that I will be filling with, uh, with signals and, and buses until I uh, fill it all with all the signals of the OVI. Uh, the most important signal probably is uh, issue, which is the bus that uh, allows the core sending an instruction towards the, the VPU. Note that uh, here the first field says instruction and it's 32 bits because it's the row instruction as it comes from the ICATS so that the VPU can decode it uh, if necessary. Then we have a scalar operand in case an instruction requires reading the scalar register, uh, an ID for the instruction so that they can refer to this instruction in the future, both the core and the VPU. Uh, information about the status registers in case the core executed some uh, configuration instruction and well, a valid bit. Then we have this credit back. Uh, but most of the buses in, in the OBI use this credit system in which the core or the VPU consumes a resource and, and the counterpart has to respond by giving back a credit when it frees the, the resource. Next, we have the, the dispatch uh, bus. So this bus is used for two opposite things. Uh, first, it's used to kill an instruction. So for example, imagine that the core sends a, a VAT, a vector at, towards the VPU, but there is an older load being executed on the core. And this load has an exception, so it needs to abort the instruction. It will do so by sending this kill signal. Now, the problem with killing a, a vector instruction on the VPU is that it might be very complicated. You need to be able to roll back. For example, if you have already started writing results from the VAT, then making a rollback might be very complicated if you don't have rename it or something similar. For this reason, we also have the next senior signal, which is uh, a signal that's warranted to arrive at some point to the VPU, indicating that this instruction is not going to be killed. So this signal can be sent, for example, when the instruction is the oldest uh, in the core, so, such as it's warranted that no older instruction is going to interfere with it. In this way, the VPU is free to wait until it receives the next senior before starting executing the instruction. In this way, uh, you, can, you don't need to implement a rollback mechanism on the VPU if you don't wish to do it. Uh, finally, we have the, the completed, uh, completed bus which is used by the VPU to indicate the core that it has finished completion of the instruction. This bus also sends information about the instruction that has been executed, for example, flags, or data we written on the scalar register in case of some instructions need this uh, writing on the scalar register file. So uh, I'm gonna show you here uh, how this interaction looks like. First, imagine there's some vector instruction that crosses the pipeline of the core, and at some point, the core will issue this instruction. Uh, after some time, the core will issue the next senior. As I said, this signal is guaranteed to arrive at some point, either this or a kill. Uh, now, the VPU can decide to start executing this instruction, or if it supports rollback, it can decide to execute it before this point. When the 
PPU finishes the execution of this instruction, it will send the completion signal along with the data I described before. And uh, also it should return the credit that the core implicitly consume when issuing the instruction. Next, uh, I will talk about uh, vector load instructions. Uh, it's important to note that the vector load instructions also use these signals that uh, I described. All the instructions use these signals. But the vector load requires extra signals because it needs to synchronize core and VPU executing the load. So the first important signal uh, about the load, besides the one that I introduced, is the sync start. The sync start is a signal that the VPU generates towards the core to indicate that the instruction can start the execution. Uh, after this has been said, the VPU can also start sending masks or indexes towards the core in the case of a vector load with masks or an index vector load. Next, the core has this path, the data bus, uh, that contains the data from memory, as well as uh, valid bit and masks, uh, information about the mask in case this is a masked load. And the, the sequence ID, which is uh, something I will talk about a bit more later, that uh, identifies where do we place this data on the VPU. The last important signal for the for the vector load is the sync end. This is a signal that the core sends towards the VPU when it has finished sending all the data, and it will inform the VPU that there is no more data coming. So let's see again how this looks like. Uh, First, the core will issue the instruction. Then uh, the, we need to wait until the VPU is ready and sends the sync start to inform the core that it can start the execution of this instruction. Uh, at this point in time, the VPU can decide to start sending masks or indexes if this uh, vector load requires it. Once the core has received the, the masks or the indexes, it can start generating the addresses. At some point, the data will arrive from the memory system. And, and note here that, uh, that the data might arrive out of order. So it's very common that a memory system cannot guarantee uh, that the data will arrive in the same order as it was requested. For example, if we have an L1 and an L2, data that hits in the L1 will arrive naturally earlier than data that hits in the L2, and this might be out of order. Uh, this is another reason why we have the sequence ID, but I will talk the next slide about it. After the data has arrived, the well, after, after the data has been sent towards the VPU, the core will raise this sync and signal, indicating that all the data has been sent. This will be acknowledged by the VPU with the completed valid. And now the instruction is complete. So to reiterate, the Data might arrive out of order, uh, but to add into, into that problem, more than one vector load can exist at the same time. Of course, this depends on the implementation, but it's desirable that there is more than one vector load to increase performance. Uh, also, the core does not process the data that comes from memory. The core instead sends cuts towards the VPU without processing. So we need some way to tell the VPU where to place this data. And this is the sequence ID that I mentioned earlier. So the sequence ID contains the following information. It contains a logic vector register to tell the VPU where to place the data and what register, an ID to indicate to what element of the ones that were requested correspond this, this, uh, this data, an offset to indicate where in the cast line this data is placed, a count to to indicate how many elements and an ID to specify, specify which vector load in particular in case there's more than one. Uh, now there's something interesting about the spec of the RIS-5 is that it allows for any arbitrary stride. And a stride, uh, strides is something that's used to spread that data uh, across different address in regular patterns. For example, uh, one byte every 500 bytes or every 738 bytes or whatever, you can have literally any stride. So uh, the OVI in general 
uh, only supports for simplicity sending one element per line in most strides, uh, with the exception of what we call fast strides. These are specific patterns of strides that we consider are most common that allow you to send more well, several elements in the same cat style. For example, these patterns are unit strides, which means uh, every every element is consecutive one after the other, or two SCW strides. This means the standard element, the size of the element. So this is uh, every other element is valid, or one every four elements. And we also have the negative uh, counterparts of these three ones, which is the minus one, minus two, and minus four. Uh, in this way, we can uh, pack more data into a cast line when sending it towards the review. Uh, this, if this sounds a bit confusing, I will show now an example. So uh, hopefully, it will be more clear. Imagine, for example, that we have uh, cast lines of 512 bits. And an SCW, this is the width of the element of 32 bits. Uh, now, in the case of the unit stride, as I mentioned, this means that the elements come consecutive one after the other. So imagine if we have this cat line here, note that uh, since the cat line is 512 and the elements are 32 bits, there is 16 elements in this, in this cat line. We, will, we can receive uh, a sequence ID such as this, for example, indicating that the cat line contains the element zero, which will be the first element of the vector load, and is placed on the offset 11, and there is five elements. So this allows the, the VPU to extract this, this data from the cat's line. Next, uh, we can have, for example, a two SCW stride. This is one every other element is valid. In this case, uh, we'll again have an offset indicating where is the first one. The first one is the zero again in this example, and we can have three elements, for example. Uh, for cases in which we have very big strides or just strides that don't fit the pattern that the OVI supports, or, or just indexed loads, we'll still send uh, one element, one element at a time. Um, it will look like this. We have, again, the ID indicating what element are we talking about, an offset indicating where it is placed, and a count indicating that there is only one. Uh, next, let's talk about uh, the vector store instructions. Again, the vector store will use most of these signals, except the, the load bus. Uh, besides, Besides those signals, it will also use this last bus, the, date, the stored data bus. Uh, this, this is a very simple bus. It just contains some data, a valid bit, and again, the same credit system that we had before. By the way, these are the complete, the complete interface of the OVI. There's no more, no more signals than the ones on the screen right now. So the store uh, works like this. Uh, we, again, issue the instruction. We have to wait again for the sync start, same as the as the vector load. At this point, the VPU can start sending the data towards the core by consuming credits doing so, and the core will return the credits as, as it frees resources. Once the core has finished sending the data towards the memory system, it will act, it will inform the VPU by reaching the sync end signals, same as in the case of the vector load. Uh, this will be acknowledged by the by the VPU by raising the complete value. So just to reiterate some of the points I have already made. Uh, this, this interface is especially suited to, uh, to have a core very decoupled from the VPU. Uh, the VI does not really make many assumptions about the core design or even the VPU, although it assumes that the VPU implements a decoder. Thanks to, thanks to this implementation of the decoder, you can have instructions that the core doesn't know about, or you can add newer instructions without modifying the core at all. The core just does not need to know about them. So this is uh, all for more part. Uh, you can find this specification in, in this link. And now if you have any questions or doubts, please feel free to ask. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, all right, so if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat while we switch over for our next presentation. There were two questions on the Q&A which I answered, so you, and otherwise, thank you. Thank you.